Warning, the following episode may contain explicit language, references to old-timey drug use, and complaints about enduring residency training, because those scars run deep. Oh, and I forgot to add, please don't take medical advice from this podcast. It's for informational purposes only. Entertainment. That sort of thing. Enjoy. The year is 1889, and William Stewart Halstead is on rounds with his residence at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Do-do-do-do. All right, all right, you young physicians, as you can see here, this, this next patient is... Wait, 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 wait. Is it just, just the two of you? Yes, sir, Dr. Halstead. It's just us two. Nobody else showed up for rounds. Ah, this is unconscionable. How on earth are we supposed to teach medicine if nobody is here to learn? Rounds start promptly at 0300. There's no time to waste. Well, sir, we've slept very little in the past several days, and it seems that you haven't slept at all. I think everyone's exhausted. We've been going nonstop for weeks. It's been very difficult to acclimate to this pace. Nonsense. What you all like is gumption. You're in the first year of your training. You with your young constitutions, why waste time sleeping when you could be learning and practicing the art of medicine as much as possible? Uh, Sir, I, I think we need at least a little sleep. It's difficult to concentrate with so little rest. I fear it may be interfering with our ability to learn and care for these patients safely. Ah, pish posh. Training should be grueling. That way you appreciate what you have. Not everyone has the right to call themselves doctor. Besides, you guys have it much easier than I did. Training was much harder back in my day. What right have you to complain? Wait, didn't you come up with this atrocious residency system, sir? Ah, I had to. There was no organized way of teaching young doctors how to take care of patients. There was no discipline. There was no organization. Why, in my day... Sir, you've you got some cocaine on your nose. Oh, oh. quite right. Woo. Woo. Where was I? You were wondering where everyone is. So I was. Where is, uh, where is, where's, where's, what's his name? Edwin. Where's Edwin? Edwin quit last week. Don't you remember him ranting and raving as he kicked down the exit door to the hospital? Yeah. He said he'd curse you till the day he died for the pain and torment you put him through. Ah, I thought that was a dream. He just started his residency a month ago. That can't be right. And if you're looking for Chadwick, he's been committed. Oh, yeah. Poor guy. Committed? What do you mean? Well, he's in the asylum, sir. Two weeks ago, he went stark raving mad after being up for 72 hours. He tried to perform a surgery on the patient in bed six with the appendix problem. Mm. Did it go poorly? No. Actually, the surgery was brilliant. It was on the wrong person. The patient he did surgery on already had their appendix removed. Ah, that's improbable. If the patient didn't have an appendix, what did Chadwick remove? Well, that's not exactly clear. Ah, did none of you take anatomy? Where's the specimen? Let's go find it. We should identify it ourselves. That won't be possible, sir. And why not? Chadwick ate it. Yeah, that's why they locked him up. Ooh, that's unfortunate. I guess he didn't have what it takes. Fine, then. Where is that bright fellow, the one that was here yesterday? I I think his name was Billingsworth. He's the next patient here, sir. What? How can that be? Billingsworth, what the devil are you doing in that bed? We're on rounds. He can't hear you, sir. He's heavily sedated. Oh, wait. Did he break into my office drawer? Uh, no, sir. You see, he collapsed into his bed last night in a fit of utter exhaustion. He was in a deep sleep. Now, the thing is... Yes? Well... We accidentally operated on him while we were sleepwalking. What? Operated? What sort of operation did you do? Honestly, we have no idea. Yeah, your guess is as good as mine. This is madness. Complete madness. How are we supposed to run a teaching hospital like this? You need experience. You need stamina. You need an iron will to call yourself a doctor. Now what? It appears he's dead, sir. How could he be dead? He was just standing there talking. Sheer exhaustion, I'd imagine. Hmm. Maybe we should try some cocaine to get his heart started? I don't think that'll work, sir. Well, shouldn't we do something? No, it's probably for the best. Uh, Well, you know what they say. More for me. Cocaine is good for the heart, you know. Nope. No, it's not. You can order it from a Sears catalog. That at least I know is true. Yep. Yep. Sure can. (laughs) All right. (laughs) I enjoyed that. So much of that sounded familiar. (laughs) Maybe not the coke part, although I'm sure that happened. For historians, for historians, for historians. Welcome, everyone.
everyone. This is Poor Historians, a podcast delving into the archives of medical history. As three practicing emergency physicians, we will explore the unusual ailments, treatments, physicians, and all related material having to do with the healing arts. I'm Max, and I'm joined here by my good friends and colleagues, Aaron and Mike. Here we are on another fine day to discuss a topic I think we all won't soon forget. I think it may be helpful to briefly summarize how one becomes a doctor nowadays. So go ahead and summarize. Me? Yeah, I guess. Uh, you take a bunch of tests, you either pass them or you don't, and then you go to the <laughs> next step, and then you just get kind of shuttled through like your cattle, and you, you just kind of go with the flow. Nice. And nice. then they give you a short white coat, and then they give you a long white coat, and then you disappear into the sunset. <laughs> right. So there may be people listening that don't don't know about the whole residency system. Yeah, I always thought, I thought it was I thought it was weird too, like the word resident, right? You, well, you kind of do live at the hospital, right? So, yeah, four years of school after the test, you get. Through oh, you the wanted specifics? Is, oh, yeah. Like, how do you? How do we be, become I'm a, a doctor? Big picture person. <laughs> well, it was a good big picture. Yeah, yeah. Four years of school, right? Very grueling school, and then in that school, you have two years in the hospital where you're a short coat, as as Mike mentioned. That's a you know, that's how they know you're a med student. Then after you graduate, you have to go through a process where you match to what's called a residency. And that is basically a teacher's salary for hundreds of hours of work in a row at a hospital somewhere in your chosen specialty, right? And some of them are really competitive these days, and all of them are at least three years long. So the shortest ones, three straight years of training, uh, up to, I believe, nine years is the longest for like neurosurgery. Right. Is that just the residency? Because they probably have like a surgical year for or one or two years, transitional year. Yeah, there's sometimes a year in between when you're an intern, which is, you know, kind of like a glorified medical student. You do all the grunt work. And then sometimes they'll do a fellowship where they're almost a doctor, but they still get paid a lot less and they're still well, they're supervised. Doctors count. They're yeah. Doctors. So the, we're, all doctors. Like, we're all doctors. We're all doctors. That's true. Yeah. Sorry, attending. attending. Well, basically the overview is you... You go to high school, you graduate high school, you go to college, you get your college degree, you apply to medical school, go to medical school for four years, and then you select a residency and that residency kind of dictates what sort of doctor you're going to be. And so with with, with that in mind, before we get going with the topic, I, I just have to ask, what stands out as your worst residency shift? Yeah, so uh, last trauma rotation of my first year as a resident um, and trauma at our place, big place, right? Very, very busy. It was summer. There were patients all through the night hurt, you know, and we'd have to they'd come in and, and you'd have to take care of each patient as they came. And, and so it's a very long night normally. And as the intern, you're doing a lot of work and admitting people and doing a lot of paperwork, but I also was horrifically sick. So I had the worst stomach bug I would sort of not want to wish on somebody else the whole shift. And it was a call shift. So I was there overnight. So I would literally, you know, I'd like run to the bathroom, feel like I was going to puke. And then there'd be another, the pager would go off again while I'm in the bathroom, run out, take care of the patient. Now, you know, I had gloves on and such. So hopefully I didn't give it to anybody. And then I just go back and collapse in between and pop another anti-nausea pill and just try to make it through. And it just was miserable. I mean, that's a long shift anyway, but and the thing was, is there was never a thought in my mind that I could say, hey, I'm sick. I need to go home. Like just it wasn't even an option because like, then somebody else would have to do my job. So that that one, though, oh, man. And then you have to put on when the, the trauma patient comes in, you have to put a gown on and you have to put lead on because they're going to shoot an X-ray. So I was already like probably a little feverish and dehydrated. <laughs> and then you got to put all this stuff on. So you sweat like crazy and traumas you know, they keep the room really hot because it's good for the patient, which they absolutely should. But so I'm sitting there sweating through, I don't know what else. It just, it was miserable. I mean, it so still many stands fluids. out. Yeah. So many fluids <laughs> it's, escaping. It's the worst. I definitely, mine was, mine was also first year and uh, in my residency, in your first year, you would do among the, the, <clears throat> among the month of work, you would do one week in the or you do four weeks in the neurointensive care unit, but one of those weeks was spent as the overnight intern, and you were basically in charge of the neurointensive care unit at a tertiary hospital, and that meant taking 
all the admissions. So a new patient gets either admitted through the emergency department or from some other hospital that can't uh, provide the level of care. And I, in it was a 16 hour shift. And in 16 hours, I did 16 admissions uh, to the intensive care unit. <laughs> oh and goodness. at one point had to call a fellow and be like, Hey, I have uh, 10 patients to staff with you. <laughs> when ICU patients are super complicated. Oh, yeah, each they're one. super sick. And uh, you uh, know what? Everybody did okay that night, except for me. Yeah. I still, I'm still scarred. Mm-hmm. I don't know, Mike, you got anything? Yeah. I mean, well, just some of it's just the time that you were there. You know, I, uh, our neurosurgery rotation, I think was in our second year and we took Q 24 hour call. So every other day you were on call for 24 hours. So, and you know, the day doesn't end. It's, it's not like you start at 7 a.m. So I think we started at five or six for rounding. Then you work until 6 a.m. the next day, but then you have your normal day. So you're there till about 4 30, 5 o'clock. Then you go home and then you come back at six o'clock the next day and you're there for 24 hours plus your normal work day. It was just insane, um, yeah. exhausting. You know, who, maybe we'll talk about the benefits and the detriments to doing that later, but. Uh, I think one of the worst was um, an OB rotation. We had a day, we were just delivering babies like mad, like didn't sleep, didn't sleep, didn't sleep, didn't get to eat. We were just like back to back to back. And then about, I think it was about four o'clock in the morning, we had to do a crash C-section and um, I'm standing there and I can feel my, I'm st- I start to drip with sweat and the scrub nurse looks over at me and like, I could tell that she thinks something's up and my knee buckles a couple times, like. And then I start falling forward into the surgical field. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, I got to sit down and drink some orange juice. I didn't fall into the body cavity or anything, but yeah, you don't want to do that. But you learn some skills. You learn some oh, skills it, from no. this. You learn how to fall asleep in a moment's notice. Like some That's of us true. get, yep. you know, yep. some of what we do is stressful. So you might have issues with insomnia or like rumination yeah, and things like yeah. that. But like in residency, if you found a chair, I could fall asleep in that chair within five minutes. Yeah. Middle of the day. It could be four o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> I just got 10 hours of sleep the night before. If somebody was like, you need to go to sleep right now, I was sawing logs. Well, and I think this kind of mirrors the the story of how this whole system started because there's definitely a duality to it, which we can sort of get into, you know. I think you know perfect transition, I yeah, would say, yeah. and or segue. So yeah, let's uh, let's hop to our segment. What are we? Uh, yeah, so talk about here. We're going right? to talk about the guy that started residency, and um, you know, some people might say when they're listening to us talk, to so well, this sounds kind of like what it takes to be a partner at a law firm or work in Silicon Valley, and and so on. Like there are a lot of places that have this sort of on ramp, but leave aside the fact that I some of those places I think are also very exploitative. And just, you know, when you're listening to us talk about this, I think the other thing we want to emphasize is what the content was for those, like what we were actually doing and how emotionally taxing it was and intellectually taxing that you're, you know, intubating people, it's the worst day of their life, they're sick as heck, you're scared, you don't want to do anything wrong. So, I mean, in addition to what everyone was saying with the hours, it's just, you know, how it's hard to really, really convey this residency system, what it's like. How did this start? It started because of William Stewart fucking Halstead. That is how we ended up with a system. <laughs> this guy, this this guy. So prior to, to Halstead, uh, there was no residency requirement at all. So no, no residency system. People just went to med school and then arranged their own training. I'm not saying that's we should go back to that, but that's the story we started with. I mean, that we're actually in one of the more forgiving residencies, to be honest. You know, I mean, surgical residents have more years than EM, emergency physicians. Uh, and I've seen, I've literally seen cardiothoracic surgeons asleep in a chair for 45 minutes in the middle of four consecutive open heart surgeries. In one They're not shift. doing the surgery asleep, are they? Nope, nope, not the surgery asleep. And Skills I got to say, and... I mean, that surgeon was completely badass. I mean, I they did all of them. But how is how is that? How the hell did we end up <laughs> that system? I don't. That's what I wanted to kind of explore. So this Dr. Halstead was one of the giants of early medicine. And quite obviously, he was definitely a damn genius. I mean, he was born in 1852, he went to school in 1874. And we've established with the prior episodes that, you know, a lot of medicine was not optimal. 
Um, so it's he, kind of, it's kind of the point of our show, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. We're thematically on point. One of the big four surgeons who founded Johns Hopkins, which is a giant in training and in surgery and championed and introduced aseptic techniques to surgery, which, you know, probably saves millions of lives uh, over the years, came up with numerous new techniques. He pioneered cancer surgery, you know, mastectomy for breast cancer, among many other things, and is called by some the father of modern surgery with the capital letters there. Mm. He also was addicted to both cocaine and morphine and invented residency, which is the foundation of our current medical training system. And I just kind of have an issue that our current training regimen was designed by somebody, again, totally addicted to cocaine and reflects (laughs) where that leads him. And entering- so I just heard Aaron say that the foundation of uh, medical training is cocaine and morphine. Is that correct? Or is that out of context? <laughs> I think that's a, one conclusion one could draw. Have you guys ever watched the show, um, The Nick? No, but I've no. heard you recommend it, actually. Yeah, yeah it is you. fantastic. Essentially, they're describing the main character is essentially this guy, you know, and um, it's just a great period show about early medicine. And the guy's addicted to drugs and really I interesting. Mean, interesting. Yeah, interesting I mean, we'll watch. go through the story. I, I definitely, it'd be interesting to be a fly on the wall at multiple points through his life. So, and you know, he, he grew up exactly like you'd expect for a coke addict who changed medicine. Um, Andover and then Yale graduate in the mid 1800s from a really rich family. He had an early setback when he didn't quite make the skull and bone society. Um, probably oh. gave him a chip on his shoulder that he used for the rest of his life to go on and achieve greatness. Typical for the time, he didn't kind of know what he wanted to do and thought medicine sounds kind of cool. So he went to Yale because it was easy for him. And very interestingly, totally burned out his second year. So he's studying really hard. And he says himself, he, he completely burned out. He took time off and <laughs> just so awesome that he could do this. Just kind of went up to northern New England and the Hamptons and fished. I don't know if it's the Hamptons, but it's got to be fished, sailed. It, it's, might as well be. Yeah. You know, appropriately, very, I, I would support him in this. He treated his own burnout. Um, and because he was refreshed, came back and totally aced a test to get in as the sort of house surgeon, which was what passed for a resident at that time. And he met uh, someone we may have mentioned before, Lister, who was the one who sort of came up with this aseptic technique in surgery. And Lister was, he was like one of the students of uh, Liston, right? The, yeah. The knife guy. Yeah. So, how so we got all... like a, a direct line, man. Yeah. Interesting. It's like the Kevin Bacon thing, but they're <laughs> all the father of modern surgery. It's like every single one of them. <laughs> Do you think they all just like, well, I'm the father of modern surgery. And then the next guy is too. <laughs> Well, He's got to be a grandfather of modern surgery. Well, yeah. Didn't we refer to Liston as the like drunk the uncle of modern yeah. surgery? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if we didn't, we should have. I think yeah. we did. I think we did. So he actually talks about the test to get admitted to Bellevue Hospital. He took it a year early as a lark. And he remembers that walking into the room feels great because he's just spent a summer on the on the Cape fishing and sailing. And he looks at all his competitors who have been locked in apartments in New York cramming for the test. He says taking strychnine for some reason to deal with the heat. Strychnine is it's, it's rap. I don't know why that would work. But so he remembers walking in and looking around at all these pale, tired students and be like, yeah, I got this. Well, they're probably pale and tired because they're taking strychnine. <laughs> that didn't help them. It did not help them. Yeah, no training programs at the time in the U.S. officially. Um, ether had just been introduced in 1842, which we might have also referred to. Then the Civil War happened, so surgery was kind of booming. And he took some time, which we can't really delve into to study with a ton of great surgeons in Europe in the 1870s. And it's really kind of this golden age for surgery because everyone's figuring out what the ether means and what they can do. And almost like Silicon Valley in the, what, the seventies or something when everything's just starting to pop. Uh, It's an actual sentence in Wikipedia about an actual cocaine user. It says, quote, Halstead returned to New York in 1880 and for the next six years led an extraordinarily vigorous and energetic life. (laughs) Ah, <laughs> uh, the 80s. Yes. 1880s, but hey, still the 80s. Look at I mean, that, right? It's same, the same difference. Same difference. Nothing ever changes. It's very <laughs> cyclical. Yeah. Our the world is cyclical. Yeah, Were they wearing totally hyper hypercolor frocks? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Yeah, yeah. No socks with their shoes. Side ponies. Side ponies everywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tight rolling so had... their jeans or their slacks. <laughs> uh, who knows? 
tents exhibit search. So he would set up tents to operate at Bellevue. Um, obviously, I, I think probably had audiences. They set him up a special place. And he said it was so that because he couldn't do a septic technique inside the hospital, that it was too dirty. But I'm sure it was also, I mean, back in the day, like a tent show, you know, kind of to, to generate buzz. Um, also, very 1880s story, you know, he's said to have performed one of the first gallbladder removal surgeries as an emergency on his mother in their kitchen. So Nice. Doing surgery on your mom. I wonder how awkward that was. Dr. Halstead is called urgently to his mother's home in New York to attend to her while she is ill. Mother! I came at once. I received word of your illness. Oh, my son, it's good to see you. I've taken with a fever and I've developed pain in my stomach and it's not improving. It's been days. That is so has to be his mom's accent. (laughs) It's New York, right? (laughs) Come walk in here. You obviously have cholecystitis. Your gallbladder has become infected and obstructed with gallstones. I'm sure of it. I'm afraid we'll need to operate. Is there no other way? Mother, you are sick. We need to do something. I must operate at once. I must take out the gallbladder. We must do this tonight. Are you certain? I am most definitely certain. Woo! Ah, You are in grave danger. I need to operate immediately. It's the only way. Please listen to me. Oh, so my son's telling me what to do now that he's a famous doctor, huh? uh, Mother, if you don't have it removed, you'll... Die of sepsis. Please listen to reason. I wish there were another way. I I worry that... Now you're worried about me. You weren't worried enough to visit on my birthday a few months ago. There I was all the way to Australia again. <laughs> New York, you went to Australia. There so I... The five boroughs. Here I was. There was a man with a knife. There will be blood. No, that's a different movie. It was all by myself on the day I was supposed to be celebrating with my loved ones. Oh, come on, Mom. That's not fair. The trains were running because of the weather. You know that. It's just that I. you seem so uncomfortable. Pain must be horrible. Oh, he's worried about his poor mother's pain. Oh, my son, the humanitarian. <laughs> <laughs> really, Mother? This is absurd. I will call for some ether and I will operate to save your life. You listen to reason. I lost your father years ago. It's just me in this big, empty house. Nobody to keep me company. Why would I worry about my gallbladder? Nobody seems to worry about me. Maybe if I had some grandchildren, I wouldn't be so lonely. Oh, jeez, Mom, come on. I'm just waiting for the right girl in the right time. Waiting. Always waiting. That's the story of my life. I'm still waiting for all those letters you said you sent. It used to be a letter a week. And now... Is, is any of this necessary? This is not the time nor the place for this argument again. Who's arguing? I'm here dying from toxemia with no grandchildren to take care of me. My son, the hero doctor, is out cavorting with women all hours of the day and night. You'd think I've had at least one grandchild by now. <sighs> Mother, don't do this. Not now. Look, I apologize for being distant the past few years. I've kind of been struggling a bit, to be honest. At long hours have I worked on the wards of the hospital. I have cared for many of the sick and dying. This has taken a toll on me, to be sure. Many are counting on me there, and it is difficult for me to leave and visit. I will be better about it, though. I will make time in the future to see you and write to you more often, I promise. All right. If you think it's the only way, I suppose I'll trust you as my son. Perform the operation. Remove my gallbladder. I shall leave myself in your care. Oh, finally, we must prepare for surgery at once. I shall fetch the ether and a septic wash. I have but one request, my son. Anything, mother. I know that you're smart and intelligent, and your hands are those of a capable and brilliant surgeon. If I'm to survive this ordeal... I would ask that you make me one promise. I absolutely shall, Mother. What is it? That if you're not planning a visit for the holidays this year, you start the operation by stabbing me in the chest and ripping out my heart now, just rather than doing it later. Oh, for crying out loud. 
What's the use of crying out loud when nobody is around to hear it? I ask you that. Your poor mother has nothing to look forward to this year. My friend Mitzi is surrounded by adoring grandchildren, but here I am. And we're back. We were just talking about Halstead doing his residency thing. Um, students did love him. He was very popular. He was charismatic, you know, uh, talk of the town. And he lived with another young, handsome surgeon in the hip part of New York. And in addition to all this, they'd have like three, four parties a week, you know, just to kind of make sure that everything was going well. Other, I mean, again, I mean, he is super smart. He, he saved and bold. I mean, he saved his sister who was uh, dying of blood loss after delivering a baby, which is, I mean, that's a scary emergency. So he, he basically figured out how to give her her own, his own blood. So he just transfused her from himself. I would say that's extraordinarily lucky that he didn't kill her. So they said it was bold, but man, if he didn't have that, if he wasn't lucky enough to have the right blood type, man, that would have been not oh, and, ideal. And in, like modern, you know, I, whenever I need to give blood, it's 8,000 pages of paperwork eight different computer orders right. and typically a few phone calls. But yes, be I did order that blood and I really like it. Given. Yeah. Right. And then we have a special supply of blood. That's basically never going to react with anybody, but that's, you know, that's as valuable as gold. So I figured out carbon monoxide poisoning. So workers at that time would tend the gas lamps and then they would, you know, because they inhale too much carbon monoxide, which is a product of when something burns, you see, and, and get really sick from it. But he would, auto transfuse their blood. So he'd take out their blood, some system, he made up some system to shake the blood with oxygen, which I really want to see, and then give it back to them. You know, and, and that auto transfusion is still used today in some trauma patients with filters and, and stuff, stuff like that. So I am still picturing a shaker bottle full of blood. <laughs> it's like a shake weight. Maybe like, like a a work, shake no, weight. no, no. I mean, not unlike <laughs> that, but like a, you know, workout shaker protein bottle, but just shaking it up with blood. Right. Just kind of put the air in there. I mean, that's, uh, it's definitely something that he had to figure out on his own. Um, a figuring out, it's just shaking blood. Well, true. Yeah. Yeah. We it's, don't need it. You can shake it. That's not, but I wonder why they would yet. go there. I mean, I guess for really bad cases, but you just bring them outside and they get better over time. <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah. Um, you know, it's stated, Wikipedia says he didn't discover cocaine until 1884 when he and some other students read a report about literally eyeballing liquid cocaine from Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And um, so eyeballing... Is it like freebasing? <laughs> uh, no, no, it's way, way better. It's, I think, maybe even more metal than that. So it's a way of, of drinking or ingesting a substance where you just pour some sort of alcohol literally into your eyeball and the mucous membranes around your eye will absorb the alcohol bypasses the liver. So you get the effects faster. And for a while there was a little bit of a trend, um, with teens doing it on YouTube. So if you really want to see somebody doing it, you probably could. Now, the reason this works with cocaine is because it's often, uh, held in a, in an alcohol suspension. So you could just drip this solution into your eyeballs and take it that way. But then they decided to just start well, experimenting. I, I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt, but doesn't that burn? I, I'm sure it does. I'm until sure it goes like, numb. You know, does that burn? <laughs> yeah, until it goes. Well, you know that we had liquid cocaine in residency. And then um, even for about a, a year or two after I was out of residency, we had it for, yeah. um, you know, like if you got to pack somebody's nose, you'd, you'd soak a little nasal pack in cocaine and put it up. So it's a vasoconstrictor. So it squeezes the blood vessels down to stop bleeding. And it's a pain reliever yeah. as well. Yeah, it I works think, well. I think Mike should clarify that this was something the hospital stocked, not that he had a personal Yes, stock. the hospital stocked. Yeah, I, I remember the first time I used that on a nosebleed. It's like, wait, really? We're going to put cocaine in their nose? <laughs> Is there an extra charge? <laughs> but it must burn. <laughs> you think here. there's got to be a better way. I mean, there are better ways probably to take cocaine, but to drip it through your eyes. But maybe yeah, it's just well, what they had. You know, they, they uh, had the same thought and they tried every single possible way that they could <laughs> to take the cocaine. So they injected it all over. They tried blocking nerves Wait, with it. on themselves? Yeah. So he, he tried it on himself and then he, there was a circle of doctors and students that all self-experimented and they came up there like with this paper, they're like, oh, we managed to achieve regional anesthesia and all these different nerves. So Again, if you're if you're listening, so you have nerves going throughout your body, and sometimes you can inject a little medicine at at a nerve, like say in the arm or the hand, 
and then it makes a region of your body numb. So they, they did that with cocaine. It seemed to work really well. And the side effect was they got to inject themselves with cocaine over and over and over again. <laughs> and they figured out how to butt chug before there was an internet. <laughs> Wait, what's a right? butt chug? <laughs> A butt chug is where you put alcohol directly into your rectum to oh. <laughs> make sure it by it make sure it gets absorbed without the unpleasant tasting of it. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. One of my friends in college told me that he had a friend that lived in Sweden, and what they would do when they would go to uh, Badger games, is this guy. Well, I don't think my friend did it, but he said he would soak a tampon in alcohol and stick it up his butt before he went. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, no, it's it's a thing. You know, it's it's a thing. <laughs> Why do you, we are not supposed to be giving advice on this podcast, Mike. This isn't advice. I'm just, I'm not telling you how to do it. Like, I'm not going to tell you that <laughs> you, you can figure out how to soak a tampon in alcohol. That you and take, yeah, you open butt. the bottle. I'm not going to tell you that you just take the tampon and you dip it in there. People you know, manage gonna... to get stuff in their butts without <laughs> medical professionals telling them the steps. <laughs> but just, oh, I don't, I just don't do it. <laughs> I, I don't either. I mean, we're laughing and I think, but it was actually quite, tragic i mean they they all got addicted this whole circle and and all of them except halstead and one of his friends died i mean they they literally died of these addictions people started to notice that he was off uh he was routinely publishing articles before but he, he his articles started to get really rambly even for the time so i tried to read the the beginning of one of his articles and to be honest i even as an english major i couldn't diagram that sentence so he people started to notice that that he so he put himself on a steamship to try and detox, and his plan was to only take half of the cocaine he would normally use to sort of taper down, but that failed. Mm. That failed, and he during the trip, he actually broke into the captain's cabin to steal more cocaine and morphine. Yep. <laughs> but why would he think that the captain's got cocaine and morphine? Is that just a thing? <laughs> Like I mean, it was cocaine and morphine. You could buy it from a freaking yeah. Sears catalog. It's very just... true that it was all legally available. So, but, but why yeah, did he I don't just know. like accost another passenger or just be like, "Hey, listen, I've got money. Just give me some of that that sweet, sweet coke." <laughs> I don't know. So, what the solution they eventually came upon was that he he was admitted to a sanatorium, which I think sanatoriums we should bring back. To be honest, um, not for this purpose though, because what they did is they transitioned him to morphine, and he just mm. started taking morphine instead of cocaine, and that stabilized him. And moved to Baltimore with a colleague, and and got invited to Johns Hopkins because of you know the skull and bones and Yale and Andover connections, I'm sure. And um, that's where he sort of started the program of residency. So he started a formal program in 1889 and built on his prior idea of rounding, which I got even more mad at him when I realized that he had invented rounding, <laughs> which is walking around and seeing each patient and talking about the patient at the bedside for an indeterminate amount of time. And it takes usually hours. So he invented both of these things. Infinite. infinite amount of time. And, and a lot of times when this is done too, depending on how old school your teaching hospital is, like you're, the patient's just sitting there yeah. and it, it, it does, it feels very awkward. It's a some, little weird. Some are kind of, you know, sometimes they're, uh, I, I do recall some patients who actually either got a kick out of it or were pretty good sports about it, but I, it always struck me as like, I don't know if it's better to go off into that quarter and talk about the patient or. <laughs> I mean, it's transparent. Like they're not here. We would it's usually do it outside the room. Yeah. Fair. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. And then you, sometimes oh. you'd go in and then really it would just be like, did you take a piss last night? How much did you, <laughs> how much did you dump? Okay. All right. Yeah, we're gonna always discharge you tomorrow. Everybody, everybody in this room, push on this person's stomach. Yep. It hurts right there. <laughs> that <times>. tickles. <laughs> and you're talking about them like they're not there when you're rounding. Right. I mean, it's just, it's just kind of awkward. Um, so and, and, well, not to mention too, if you were presenting, right. So you're like, either you're a medical student or a resident and you're like, you know, this is your patient and you've been, you You've been at least in the early parts of your training. You 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 accumulate all the information overnight, and the attending, meaning the head, you know the doctor who's leading all this, is is absolutely going to find something you don't know about your patient, and then call you out on it. So you're like completely nerve wracked, and you're up there like presenting your patient who's sitting right next to you like a show dog. Yeah. It's like this is this is my patient so and so who was admitted for this, and here's what we did, and you just. It is it is such a strange thing when you really think about it. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 weird. It, it is. I mean, the hands-on part of the training, I think, is. I mean, if you were just sitting in a classroom and you never saw a patient, 
that wouldn't work either. But oh, absolutely. I mean, it's definitely an 1880s style of of talking about things. Um, when he first started his program, you were just in it until he thought you were ready uh, to move on. And so that, that would easily be six or eight years of training, quote unquote training. Mike would still be in residency. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and at the time, I mean, the annals of surgery six to is eight kind months. of... Yeah, that's right. He's ready. The The annals of surgery was, they they kind of gloss over some of the downsides of this. They're, they're all on the upside. Said it was actually a little bit kinder than the German one because it, quote unquote, focused on the student. <laughs> Which, what did the German man. one focus on? Yeah, I know that's good to focus on the student. I don't know if residency does that right now at all. Um, the it, it would be the student that did most of the surgeries, which was kind of new. And uh, so Halstead would pick like a chief resident and they do most of it. And he would kind of work in the background. Um, I'm sure that had nothing to do with the fact that he was taking a large amount of morphine daily. And then those trainees went on to sort of promulgate the system all over. So that Johns Hopkins nexus took that idea and started all these different other programs. Um, so I, I don't think it's really an exaggeration to say that, you know, he, he started this, he really kind of, kind of figured it out. Interestingly, um, the descriptions of Halstead change remarkably when he's at Hopkins, when he was in his heyday in New York, he was outgoing and charismatic and well-loved in the life of the party. And then in Baltimore, he was shy, frequently sick. He would avoid patients, kind of worked haphazardly. Osler, Are you saying that the eyeballing of cocaine made him a better, more boisterous and charismatic, well-loved doctor? <laughs> it's... All right, that's settled. <laughs> All right, yep. But again, not advice. Another giant of medicine, uh, Osler, who may get his own episode at some point, was able to confirm that after gaining Halstead's confidence, Halstead never managed to get his morphine consumption below three grains daily, also peak 1880s. But that, that works out to about 200 milligrams a day. Yikes. Yeah. So for, uh, let's see, oral morphine, I mean, a strong tablet to go home with or, I don't know, 10 milligrams, maybe. I mean, that would be sometimes. It people depends. Are, yeah, it does depend. Maybe but like if somebody's days. not taken morphine before we give five, you know, I think. Yeah. Ten. Oh, for morphine. Somewhere, I'm... Oral probably around 10. So yeah. this is just, it's a lot. It's a lot, a lot of morphine every day. Um, again, so the, back to the annals of surgery, they make a really interesting leap. It basically says that, hey, if Halstead hadn't gotten addicted to cocaine when he was really social and such in New York, he wouldn't have switched to morphine and become more scholarly. And thus we would have lost his contributions to medicine. So actually there was kind of a silver lining to his addiction. (laughs) And I mean, I think that's a bit questionable. I mean, I'm not an addictionologist, but Uh, I think, you know, we see a ton of people just really, really struggling with all kinds of addiction in the ED, and it is not a pretty picture. I don't think there's a silver lining at all. I I don't even know, though, that interesting in his case, if it's a function of the drug. I mean, I think it's it's the patient who's at the center of it. And based on his New York lifestyle with these multiple parties, I would be absolutely shocked if he wasn't sort of jumping from some dangerous pattern of drinking and other stuff to the cocaine. You know, I, I... I don't know. I just, you see his life and there's a huge pattern of addiction here. And I, I don't, I don't know if there's a silver lining there or not. Well, and, and I think, I think a lot of people, you know, who, who look unfavorably on the residency experience, which is, I think everybody who went through it, mm-hmm. uh, it, it, you know, it's not so much the hands-on stuff, right. But it's the insane hours that are worked and that, you know, the ability, you know, the, the 28 hour shifts, the, you know, endless, endless time spent residing in the hospital comes from this guy who was on stimulants and other drugs. And I'm sure I wouldn't mind working 28 hour shifts if I was coked out of my brain. <laughs> or but 30 or 36. I mean, having yeah. not been coked out of my brain, those shifts are terrible. You yeah, know? I, mean, and that, I mean, and that's where most of the gripe comes. I had a I had a cup of coffee and a cinnamon roll on my way in. That's that's what I was putting up against a line of coke. It, it didn't <laughs> compare favorably. And also, it makes sense that the the chaos of this guy's life he he created this system that was put into place to train us, and that chaos kind of lives today through residency. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that and that was what the conclusion I came through too. So. 
I mean, you're, you're dealing with a training program. The guy was a genius, right? But he's also addicted. So what you said, right? We're following in the footsteps of this guy because he essentially made a system that trained people like he wanted to be trained. And it, you're, it's, I think it's just kind of an impossible ask. The, the only bonus I had working the proverbial 28 hour shifts was that in one 28 hour shift, I ate the same Southwest chicken wrap four times, <laughs> <laughs> four times back to like at least two of those times. It was the same lady in the cafeteria who was like, really? Yep. I'm, I don't, I'm just gonna eat the same thing. Yep. It's working. But in it, it really, it simplified your life. I remember doing my, my trauma rotation and the senior was like, you sleep when you're tired, you eat when you're hungry. It was just very simple. You didn't yeah. have to worry about anything else because you knew exactly what you're doing all day. All you got to worry about is when you're going to sleep, when you're going to eat. Those are the only yeah. two things that you could control. Yeah. And then you go home and, and your partner, if, if you have one in residency, kind of says, well, I'm not even really sure why we're married right now because yeah. well, you're not I even like, here. Yeah. The system is designed to kind of break you down so it can then build you back up again. Because otherwise, I honestly don't know how many of us would be able to deal with the kind of crap that we see, you know, on a regular basis. How would we deal with that if we didn't, if we didn't have that period of time where we were broken down into our component parts? Jesus, that's dark. Don't you think? There's no way. There's no way. Oh. How do you go through those shifts where like, okay, you just pronounce this person dead and they're, you know, they're young and it's really sad and the family's all crying. And then you got to walk next door to the guy with back pain who's screaming at you because you didn't give him pain medication and you can't tell him what just happened and you got to just buck up. You get seconds to, to process this and move on to the next thing. And I think in part, the reason we could do it is because of Halstead and his fucking <laughs> mind fuckery that he developed hundreds of years ago. <laughs> he did it on drugs. Yeah. That's always been the pro argument. And I, I will say that, you know, psychologically, alone in the hospital at night listening to you know, I don't even want to listen to the same playlist because I'd probably go back there like I'm in charge of this in the ICU months yeah you you absolutely have to build a certain amount of endurance but I think I I don't think that's the only way that could be achieved and I know it's not a good way to learn I mean there's no science that says that this is this is a good way to learn and the the ethic is the issue I mean people don't take breaks you know and then I would leave for my shift and and my attending would be like, well, it must be nice to have duty hour restrictions. I'm here for another day. Like why, 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 why is it, is it set up that way? It just, I think my favorite read about it, I remember reading a, uh, um, a study in residency and, you know, the fascinating thing is under extreme sleep deprivation, which many residents will be at some point, they test it, you know, hey, can you do complex procedures, procedures that take multiple steps like, you know, chest tubes or central lines. And, you know, the, 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 the scary, fascinating thing is that you can do them beautifully, even when you are half asleep. The problem is you do them on the wrong person because you lose that amount. <laughs> you, you lose that, you know, critical thinking like, yes, you can be the robot that puts in the central line with one eye open. But uh, the scary part is that you don't always know where you are in your surroundings. Yeah. I mean, you're right. My, we would have to figure out some way to compensate for the motor learning that goes on and such. But I, I think it's well, it's sort of fascinating to look at these roots. I don't know. You think back to about what that does for you and your work ethic moving forward. You, you look at one of our partners that broke his hip. He missed one shift. Broke his hip, had a hip replacement. He missed one shift. Yeah, but like that's a little bit nuts. I'm not and saying that that's <laughs> great or right, but I just, you, that's what... You know, how many of us have missed a shift? We've had people that have gotten IV fluids on their shift because they were shitting their brains out. You know, like it's just the Halstead lives on in us. Oh, you know? totally. Yeah. There's yeah, yeah, no yeah. way. If you're kind of sick, you're going into work. If yeah, you feel good, people would you're going so, into work. I, multiple people I know, not not currently, but I've, I've definitely seen people come in. They'll be like, I got here a little early. Can a nurse like give me an IV of fluids before I start? But yeah, I, I don't, it just makes me uncomfortable. Well, and the other thing about this that, I, you know, just a quick thing here. I mean, I don't blame Halstead for the economics of this, but this helps. We're these people that are doing this, we're, we're doing it. Residents are paid the same amount. I looked this up. 
it's as much as the lowest paid public school teachers, not, not even the highest. So we're, we're making about the same amount of money as, as a poorly paid elementary school teacher and teachers work their butts off and they're awesome and they should be paid more. But what differentiates that is like how many hours that is and how much time you're at. Like the teachers aren't at school 36 hours straight. So if you bake, break it down, I mean, there's a lot of people making a lot of money on this system as well. And in fact, it's been monetized recently with venture capital firms and so on. And I should yada, yada, yada that part. But I mean, it, we're, we're using this work ethic to Weren't make we looking money for, for advertisers? other people. Yeah, <laughs> we were. Are those venture capitalist groups in here? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it just goes back, right? They're, they're, we're, they're living off the labors that people asked to emulate a genius on cocaine. And that is not. Yeah. Did same. you guys ever calculate what your hourly rate was in residency? Oh, uh, maybe once. And I was so depressed. Yeah, I blocked it was yeah, like no, $3 <laughs> and 46 cents an hour. I think something God, like dude. that. But the $3 and 46 Well, priceless. yeah, no, again, like I get, we are paying for that. So that's the other thing. Like we are, the way the system's set up is that we get paid a stipend from the hospital, but the hospital gets paid as well. So, you know, that there's that, um, we're paying for our training essentially. It's not like, yeah, yeah. Oh, you we're not doing are. it for free. Yeah. They're nope. not providing us a service for free. And, yeah. and, and it actually the, in, in, in two, to be fair, uh, they've actually made a lot of progress in thinking about this. And cause I went to residency after you guys by a little bit and, you know, there were actually things in place to try to make sure you weren't overworking residents or, you know, leading to mistakes and those sort of things. And so it's, it's not all doom and gloom. I think things will get better as things go on. There's a balance. And that's why I said it's two sides of the coin. I mean, he was a genius and he saved lives and he, you know, revolutionized medicine. So there's that side of this whole system too. It's like so. going, yeah, going to the army and saying you shouldn't do basic training anymore because people feel sad when they do it. Yeah. You know, but you need it to break us down to build us back up again. Yeah. Maybe uh, some other model besides the military. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, I'm just, you know, it's another yeah, institution I, that's existed for a long time. Yeah. And some of this might go into outtakes. I mean, I, I, do, I, I do, I feel like at some deep level, you know, my ICU months did sort of make me, they gave me that reservoir to go to when I feel really, really stressed or strained. And I'm like, I don't know if I can do this right now, or I'm in a situation that's just incredibly stressful. Definitely. I have a place to go to where I'm like, nah, this is, I got this. I can do this. Mm -hmm. and, well, yeah. Do you think about just that, just the time of soaking that stuff up. So you do a 24 hour sh shift and then maybe you see five cardiac arrests where you would have only seen one if you're only there during the day, but now you saw five. And now when you're taking care of cardiac arrest, it's on autopilot. You don't think there's no thinking, you know, it's like, you already know what you have to do. You're already thinking 10 steps ahead because you've seen this hundreds of times. I think one of my friends in residency put it best. They said, residency is the best, worst time of your life. Because yep. you're also, you know, the other bit of it is you're in there with so many other people that are, you know, whether they're in your specialty or they're in a different specialty, uh, they are, you're all sharing this experience to some degree. And it may not be the exact same experience, but there is definitely bonding in foxholes and there is very much bonding in residency. It's sort of a, yeah, for sure. It, it is truly a best worst time. Yeah. I would never absolutely. do it again. If somebody said tomorrow, <laughs> hey, you have nope. to. I'm going to start you in a new residency. No way, but yeah, yeah. I'm glad I, I'm glad I did survive it once. Well, that is all we have for today. We do appreciate everyone listening. If you like to send us a message or provide feedback, we can be reached through our website, www.poorhistorianspod.com. There you can find links to our social media sites. We do take emails at poorhistorianspod at gmail.com. So if you have an idea that you'd like to see us cover, questions, complaints, feedback, what have you, we would love to hear from you. You can email or interact with us online and we'll consider it. It's an awkward phrase that I didn't read when I wrote it down. Ah, whatever. Until next time, we are Aaron, Max, and Mike signing off and reminding you to put away your leeches, rebalance your humors, turn off your cell phone, and that you shouldn't trephinate your headache at home. Until next... Really? Are all really reasonable. <laughs> Dang it. I might take that first. Ah, all right. A little bit of a messy take is okay. That was a lot better.
All right, we got uh, getting last old. Skit. And just sweat for no reason now. It's gross. Yep. All right, what, you're getting what? Nothing. Old. Mm-hmm. All, All right, right. <laughs> gotta do another so, line here. Get ready. <clears throat> That's right. Um, Who's my mom? I don't know, Mike. You, you want to take mom? You have a, you have a very nice feminine Thinking, voice. Sure, Mrs. Doubtfire. I want Mrs. Doubtfire yeah, as my it's mom coming back. It's going to well, be. This is going to be. So I don't know if you've read through it yet, but this is basically his mom guilt trips him. Listen, I lost your father years ago. It just it's just me in this big empty hat. All right. Listen, I lost. <laughs> I lost. Him. Listen, I lost your father years. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> I lost, I lost your father years ago. No, I'm from Boston. <laughs> it's just me in this big empty house. Nobody to keep me company. Why would I worry about my my gallbladder? <laughs> Nobody seems to worry about me. Maybe if I had some grandchildren, I wouldn't be so lonely. <laughs> Should I do that again? <laughs> yeah, there's right. no way I can pull something from that. Yeah. <laughs> I lost your first, your father. When you first lo- went into it, I know. Actually, you, I, I liked it. Yeah. I lost your father years ago. It's just me in this big empty house. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody to keep me company. Why would I worry about my gallbladder? <laughs> Nobody seems to worry about me. Maybe if I had some grandchildren, I wouldn't be so lonely. I don't know. Are we gonna roll with that? I don't I... know. <laughs> yeah, just all right. Uh, all, right. all right. Okay. <clears throat> just it, do it like more subdued. It, it will make you not think of the accent so yeah. much. Yeah, like kind of like kind of weepy. You know. Yeah. It's like it's it's the soft scene. I lost your father years ago. It's just me in this big empty house. Nobody to keep me company. <laughs> Why would I worry about my gallbladder? <laughs> God damn it. Why, why is that so funny? I don't know. <laughs> it's your gallbladder. Do you uh, want all right? No, you, you I, want I me it, to, I you want a retake from the top and I can do the mom's voice? No, um <laughs> you think you can always oh, worry about his poor mother's pain. All right. All right. 